fellow Seattleite and fellow environmental journalist Madeline Ostrander may be a glutton for punishment since she's been writing about climate change for nearly 15 years. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Slate, The Nation, and was it a couple weeks ago, The Atlantic, with an excerpt from this book, among other places. She was the senior editor of Yes! Magazine for about six years and teaches nonfiction writing at Hugo House and elsewhere. And in addition to these writerly pursuits, she has taught business majors in rural Uganda, Uganda, <laughs> and caught crickets for an entomologist. And now she has her first book out, published by Venerable Henry Holt and Company. They've been around since 1866. That is just seven years after Eunice Newton Foote discovered the greenhouse effect and proposed that increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would heat up our climate. We've all had a lot of catching up to do since then, and Madeline's new book is designed to help us do just that. Madeline, good evening. Anyways, thank you all for being here, and, and thanks to everybody who made this event possible. Uh-oh. Uh, is that better? Yeah. Okay. All right. I hope I don't need to repeat that. I don't know if I can. <laughs> okay. okay, good. Uh, like Obama has that anger translator on the key and peel uh, <laughs> show, I can be your emotion translator if you're too <laughs> verklempt to get close to the mic. She's really, really worked up and emotional at the excitement of this event. <laughs> I'll stop, I'll stop, please. <laughs> uh, did you, did, no, so, okay, okay. So okay. <laughs> let's um, jump right in. How's that? Sounds good. All right. Um, and sorry, I don't have a printer at my home office, so I'm, uh, I'm improvising multimedia here. Um, uh, Madeline, your book takes readers to communities in rural Alaska, Barrier Island, Florida, urban Richmond, California, and the smoky Metau Valley, just east of us. and. These are all communities that are confronting climate change in their own way. Now, probably many people here know there's no shortage of books and journalism and punditry on the conundrum of our unraveling climate. Was there some glaring gap that, that was just burning in you that you felt that this gap needed to be filled for, for us to move ahead on discussing and thinking about climate change? Yeah, um, can you guys still hear me? Okay. Um, it's really something that I felt for a long time um, I think, you know, when I first started reporting on climate change, it always felt really personal to me. I remember um, not long after we moved to Seattle in the mid-2000s, just driving around Seattle and, um, you know, after Hurricane Katrina happened and Al Gore's movie came out and there was a lot of people thinking about climate change, but I, I, it felt very vivid to me. I, um, I had just started working at Yes! Magazine. Um, and I kept thinking about what's going to happen in this place, like where will the water levels be? What will this mean for people who are living here? Um, and then I did some reporting in uh, the Bay Area of California. I was talking to environmental justice groups. And um, folks in those groups and in that area had a very tangible way of talking about climate change that I didn't hear a lot of people, other people using at that time. Um, because they worked so much at the grassroots with communities, and because they had also watched what had happened with Hurricane Katrina, they thought about how is this gonna affect the groups that we work with, the communities that we work with, the vulnerable places where we all live, and what are the policies gonna look like, and are they gonna further worsen the kind of disparities economically and culturally that um, you know, communities of color and low-income communities already experience as a result? Of, uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I, was, I was reporting in these environmental justice communities and they were talking about climate change in a very real way about how it will affect their communities. And at the time, I felt like people weren't thinking about it that way. People were thinking about it as a big global abstract thing. And I think that even now we neglect the role that what we do in our local communities plays in this crisis because it feels so vast but I think that what happens on the level of the community is really powerful. And so I wanted to write a book that would help make it very real for people, give them stories about 
what's happening with climate change at a scale that they can understand and relate to, and give them stories about people who are doing something proactive about climate change that people could really feel like they identify with and feel maybe empowered, sort of like that Ellen Weissman quote that Ellen read. You know, people feel that they too had the power to do something in the places that they live in that can make a significant difference. Great. Now your book focuses not just on these struggles of communities to deal with this stuff, but also the emotions, difficult emotions that come around it. Um, I mean, I've been covering climate change a long time also, and I know it's not good for my mental health. I'll just, I'll just be honest there. So I wonder, um, uh, why do you think that focusing on emotions in a book, it, as, as you do in you know, great depth, why is that really important for us at this, at this moment? I think we live in a culture where we're really good at carbon compartmentalizing. Um, I think that we tend to talk about climate change in terms of science and data and, you know, sometimes and too often, I think, in terms of far away ice melting. And I mean, I'm a science journalist. Science and data are really important to me. But I think that emotions are what often what move people when you think about the number of social movements and the amount of political change that comes out of people's emotions, both for better and for worse, but you know, sometimes for better. I think that when people allow themselves to feel the kinds of losses that we're experiencing because of climate change, um, and when people allow themselves to feel outrage, I think that can be really powerful, especially when it's shared. One of the things that I point to in the book is the work of Glenn Albrecht, who's an Australian philosopher and scholar, and he observed that um, people are having this experience where the places they care about are changing in ways that make them less familiar and recognizable to them. And that can happen because of a variety of kinds of environmental damage, but one of those um, factors that can, <laughs> can make people feel this way is, of course, climate change. He calls this solastalgia, um, and which is kind of connected to the idea of nostalgia. But I think he argues, and I, I think I agree with this, that when we start talking about those kinds of shared emotions, we feel less alone, and I think that's really powerful. I think that's often where collective action comes from. So solastalgia doesn't exactly trip off the tongue, <laughs> um, but um, you said that it has up in some pop culture ways, and you think it might catch on. And, and so it's, it's not the usual emotions that people hear about uh -huh. when thinking about this, like um, grief, anger, despair, um, and you said that your book is not a book of doom. <laughs> no. That it's really trying to propel towards hope. Mm -hmm. um, but t can you explain this solastalgia a little bit and why this kind of, it's kind of a new kind of homesickness, I guess, why this is something that might uh, maybe propel us towards some kind of hope? And I'm not necessarily saying that the word solastalgia is going to be something that everybody talks about in their hairstylist place or something. I mean, who knows? But, um, <laughs> but you said there was an elect, I forget what genre, some kind of electronica <laughs> song. Um, there was a trip hop stuff, band trip -hop. that recorded something called Stol Solastalgia. Um, there have been um, artists and sculptors and um, theater groups and um, lots of different kinds of artistic works about Solastalgia. Um, and it's become a, a pretty contagious word in a lot of ways. Um, there's a companion word that Glenn Albrecht came up with that um, probably isn't as well known, but I think is also a really interesting word called solophilia. And he says that solophilia is the antidote to solastalgia. Solophilia is the sort of shared joy and comfort we get from coming together to protect the places that we care about and the world that we live in. Um, and there is some decent research that um, engaging in community having social cohesion, having um, social capital, insulates people against some of the kinds of trauma and the kinds of emotional despair that can happen when people are going through something hard. So I think he's not wrong about that. Um, I think, you know, in the chapter that I, where I talk the most about solastalgia, I talk about how there's these different moments of history where people came up with a word for shared pain. So like there's a word in Welsh for sort of a sense of longing to do with the fact that 
you know, Wales used to be its own place and then it was invaded by the English and the sense of like cultural longing and longing for independence. When people experience something together, they sometimes come up with a word to talk about that. And we're in a place where we're experience something, experiencing something really profound and new and hard, and I think it is powerful to name that. And what comes from that, I mean, what comes from that power? I mean, if it's powerful, what, what do you hope comes out of it? I mean, I think I've sort of said it already in a sense that I, I think that people feel less alone, they f um, and I think that when people feel less alone, they come together. I guess a, another example from, our, you know, the last few years of our collective experience is the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that naming the collective pain experienced by communities of color, the collective discrimination and the struggles of those communities was powerful, and it allowed other people to share in that pain, and it, al it allowed for a, a big movement to grow out of that so so i mean i think that when we name things like that um i think that it allows people to understand it better and kind of grab a hold of it um uh oh madeline uh, your chapter on the fires of the metal the mm -hmm. closest to home for us mm -hmm. in seattle um you feature a volunteer firefighter mm -hmm. who also runs a daycare center mm -hmm. and i uh, can you read for us a bit of your interaction with her? Uh, yeah. Um, that we planned this in advance. <laughs> 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 um, right. So I'm I'm gonna um, I'm not gonna read straight out of the book, even though I have these tucked in the book, and that's because I sort of abridged them a little bit for the purposes of having lots of time to talk to you guys. Um, so. Uh, Carlene Anders is one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met, truly. Um, she's been a firefighter for, I believe, more than two decades at this point. Um, she was, for many years, the mayor of Pateros. She became the mayor after Pateros, Washington, which some of you have probably been there. It's along the Columbia River. It's a small town. A large section of it burned down during the Carlton Complex fire. And that community really had to rebuild itself out of the ash, a lot of parts of the city. Um, people lost everything. Carlene became the head of that effort, really just motivated by her desire to give back to her community. And so um, five years after that fire, I went out there and I met with her and we walked through the downtown and she talked to me about that experience. And so um, this is that a piece of that, um, I met her at at the downtown right on the waterfront, and we're walking along. So here we go. I couldn't observe any evidence of the wildfire, but Carlene gestured to the many things that had burned down and were now gone, as if conjuring ghosts. It was all on fire. You used to have trees and all kinds of stuff between the railroad tracks and the highway right there, she said. We walked through a parking lot and followed a sidewalk, made a stop at her office to collect some keys, then crossed the street to a retail building with a red metal roof and dark windows. It was only temporarily a museum. She and her husband owned the building, she told me, and were planning eventually to open a restaurant there called Fire and Ice, in recognition of Carlene's history as a firefighter and ski instructor. The name was also, as her mom would point out, an inadvertent Robert Frost illusion. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. When she opened the glass door and switched on the lights, we were facing a large square mirror mounted in a white wooden frame and propped against a cloth draped stool. I'll let that truck go by for a second. Um, Carlene grinned sheepishly as I took a photograph of our reflection. Hand painted across the mirror, were the words, Welcome to the Smoke and Reflections exhibit. The entire exhibit had a handmade feeling, laminated photographs pinned on black fabric, an image of a brick chimney still standing while the rest of the house it had belonged to was nothing but ash, an ATV so warped it looked like folded cloth. Some images were donated by community members, including a local photographer. Some were Carlene's. A picture of a young woman and an older man clearing a yard full of ash beside a concrete wall. This is my daughter, she said. 
This is the house that we built when I was young. This is my husband, she said and gestured to the image. It occurred to me that she had been reciting these same details to people for years. Is it hard to keep telling this story? I asked. It depends, she said. People told me that you had to tell the story eight to 12 times before you start to lose that emotional piece of it. And so telling a story probably helps. Plus, there were reasons to keep reminding people. As she and I walked through the exhibit together, she worried aloud about the complacency that can set in even after a crisis. The problem is, five years down the road, are we still going to remember, she reflected, and it's going to get worse. There's no way it's not going to get worse. So we better be prepared, better do as much as we can while we can. I'm scared to death for the other side of the mountains. She looked at me meaningfully. The earthquake when it comes will be tough on everybody too. Be lots of fire then. The west side of the mountains, my side had active and dangerous tectonic fault lines. And while the forests there were damper, they could certainly burn if warmer weather dried them out enough. Where do you live? Just saying, she said. I mumbled something about my house in Seattle, realizing that I had no particularly solid plan for any of the situations she was alluding to. So, <laughs> so Madeline, I'd like to ask you what you asked Carleen. Is it hard to keep telling this story, something you've been working on for years, something that no matter what we do collectively, uh, things are going to get worse. Is it hard to keep telling this story for you? Yes, yeah, it gets really hard sometimes. Um, I think it was actually especially hard working on this book because it was so immersive. I mean, I, I spent, you know, when you write even a magazine story, it's maybe four or 5,000 words or something, and sure, sometimes it's, it's a very deep story and I might spend months reporting it. But this I was writing, you know, this book is 100,000 words long, not to brag, but I <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> in any case, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I found myself just, uh, of course I don't, I don't know what it's like to lose my house to fire, thankfully. Um, you know, and I don't know what it's like to, as in one of these stories, go through a major industrial accident. But I felt a piece of that. You know, I felt so much empathy for the people that I was writing about, and it, it made it everything much more real to me. I think that I feel even more compassion for the people that I'm writing about and for the struggles that we're all facing as a result of climate change because of writing this book. And how long would you say you've been working on this book? Yeah, so it depends on when you count the start date. So um, you could say three years, which is when I got the contract from my publisher, or you could say more than 10, which is when I first started thinking about it, which I think is true for a lot of authors. Um, they think about something for a really long time. <laughs> and if you could give uh, the Madeline of then a bit of advice about this book, <laughs> what have you learned? What would you, what would you, what would you tell yourself? Oh, wow. Um, I think one thing I learned, I don't know if this is like the deep insight, this is more of a writerly insight, but just the, the way that you write a book, the architecture of a, of a book and how the story goes is different from the way that you write a magazine article. And you have to, you know, kind of rearrange your thinking a lot in terms of how you're building a book. And I think it, it took me a while to get myself out of magazine writing brain and into the book. Um, and I think that one thing that came up during the book that was good for me was that I, it, t it took me a little while to allow myself to, to have space to play on the page, right? To really stretch out and allow my thoughts to expand and tell the story because I was so used to writing to certain kinds of word counts. Um, and I don't know if that's something I necessarily would have told the Madeline of several years ago. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is something that was new for me that I learned in the course of writing this book. And, and you mentioned the structure, the uh -huh. structure of, of books in general. So your book seems to have a, what to me seemed an unusual, unusual structure, really kind mm. of flipping back and forth between two really different 
types of chapters. C can you talk a little bit about why you chose that approach? Yeah, so I mean, I wanted to tell some stories, but I also wanted to play with some ideas. So I think I admired people like Elizabeth Colbert um, or like Alan Weissman who've written kind of big think books about climate change. But I also really wanted characters and stories that people could resonate with. So the way the book is structured is there's f there are four narrative stories. They take place in four different locations and communities that are dealing with different impacts of, of climate change. And in part one of the book, um, each of those communities, it's sort of like the classic st story structure in a way, right? So the, the classic hero's journey is that the hero realizes they're in a new world. And we're all in a new world because of climate change. But in these particular communities, people really had to confront and come to terms with the fact that they were in a new world of new risks. So for instance, in the Matau Valley, um, Carlene had fought fires for many years, but she had to come to terms with the fact that the fires today are not the same as the fires of the past. The fires today are really difficult to impossible to control. Um, some of the other communities are uh, Richmond, California, which is a frontline fossil fuel community. Richmond went through a major um, refinery fire in 2012, and I think it really crystallized for people the connection between their community and our fossil fuel economy and climate change and what they were fighting for and against. Um, another one is St. Augustine, Florida, where they've experienced some pretty major hurricanes and also a huge increase in what's I think probably misnamed nuisance flooding. So flooding that happens like on a on just a rainy day or like a, a tide a big tide comes in and it seeps up through the storm drains. St. Augustine is also one of the most historic cities in the country. It was settled by the Spanish in the 1500s. Um, and the fourth one is New Talk, Alaska, which is a community that's relocating because of permafrost thaw and degradation, and they're having to move to a new village site. Um, so they're all very different, but the structure is parallel. The structure is people in a place realize they're facing a new set of threats. And in the second part of the book, people in that place figure out what to do about that set of threats. Um, but I think I put the, there's these essay style chapters in, the, in between these, and I think I put them in there par partly as a little bit of a resting place, you know? Um, we don't know why. For you or the reader? Maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a place to just stand back and think about some big questions about what it means to face climate change at home and who we become and how we understand that moment. So that's the structure of the book. Um, you, you've basically written a whole book around the, the idea of home. Obviously a very powerful um, concept throughout human history probably, right? And um, uh, so it's very powerful. I wonder, and you do get to this a little bit in the book, but I want to ask, is it also dangerous? Um, th this defense of home kind of idea might lead people to make bad decisions. They might cling to a community that really it can't exist anymore unless it's com completely rebuilt at federal government expense every five years. Or it might lead to people trying to exclude others from gaining access to that home. So is it a kind of a double-edged sword? I think it can cut both ways, and I think it depends on how people relate to home and community. Um, in one part of the book, I describe kind of a couple different ways of relating to home, and I, I talk about um, the late essayist Bell Hooks. Um, she reflects on home as sort of a capitalist idea, home as property and real estate versus home as community. I think that in the best circumstances, people connect to home as, as community, as a place they love, as a landscape they care about, as caring for the people around them. And I think that has a way of enlarging our sense of who we are. And I think that when people are in that place, they're much more compassionate to each other, thankfully. Um, and there are some studies, in fact, that when people um, have a greater sense of what social scientists call place attachment, sometimes they're actually more motivated to prepare for disasters. Um, there are some communities in around New York City 
that had a very strong sense of place that got together and decided to let go of the place they lived in and to let it you know go back to being um, a nature area and you know accept buyouts and that came out of a sense of the you know collective desire to to do something positive together um, but I do think there can be a danger of people becoming uh, too insular or too defensive about a place having to look like what they thought it looked like in the past. And, and I think it depends on what motivates people and where they're coming from. Um, so I try to reflect on both of those things in the book. Although I think that, to be fair, the main um, people that whose stories I tell in the book are people who are more coming from the sense of a uh, desire to protect community, a desire to protect something they care about. Great. This is something I need to do for the radio version of this. I'm speaking with Seattle author Madeline Ostrander about her new book, At Home on an Unruly Planet. I'm KUOW environment reporter John Ryan, here in front of a live audience outdoors at The Collective in downtown Seattle. Madeline, uh, in New Talk, Alaska, mm -hmm. you tell the, t the very prolonged, uh, it's kind of a saga of how long this village has been trying to move, how long, it's no how long it's been kind of a poster child for climate change, for climate refugees. And you're kind of, it's only when you're finishing the book, finishing your reporting, that you're finally managing to actually build new houses and relocate some folks. Mm -hmm. And I came away with that thinking, my God, if we, if it's going to take us, what, almost a quarter century to kind of react to whether it's sea level rise or in this case, loss of ice leading to more erosion of a river near the sea, um, that's way too slow. And that kind of took some wind out of my sails. And I wonder if you have a different takeaway from your reporting in New Talk, Alaska. Yeah, I think I felt both of those things um, and some other things. I felt I grew genuinely concerned about the community of New Talk, Alaska. New Talk is a population of primarily Yupik Alaskans, Native Alaskans. They still speak Yupik as a first language. They're still very connected to their culture. They still practice subsistence hunting. Um, I should say their traditional culture as well as, um, you know, I mean, American culture. They straddle both worlds, really. Um, and um, they're really at risk. If that community weren't to make it across to the other side of the river and had to move to Fairbanks or something, or were scattered, um, there would be a pretty serious danger that they would lose that sense of cultural continuity. And they, are, they were very worried about that as well. Um, it's, a, it's complicated because that community has a harder situation than a lot of places. They're really having to build from scratch. If you're trying to build in the Alaskan tundra, it's kind of like trying to pioneer in the 19th century or something, um, or s settle. Uh, y you know, it, w when European Americans came out here, I mean, of course, indigenous communities had their own you know, ways of living on this landscape, but when European Am Americans came out to the West, they were trying to create infrastructure and create their own particular way of relating to the landscape on their own. When you're trying to build a village in rural Alaska that has modern capabilities, you're having to build infrastructure from scratch, roads, electricity, everything really. Um, so there's that. Um, but it, it is also true that there's a long time horizon on infrastructure. Um, I think I was heartened by the fact that this tiny little community was able to mobilize and get together and actually be able to build something on the other side of the river despite incredible odds and huge obstacles. But I do think that it bears some consideration <laughs> that a lot of communities are lagging behind in planning for climate risks. And if we're going to change up infrastructure, we're going to change our roads, and we're going to change our bridges, we need to do it now and, and yesterday, <laughs> not wait until we see what happens or what disasters are coming. There was one moment in New Talk where you talk about how some of the locals 
were kind of sick of reporters, is, is how yes. I remember it, because um, uh -huh. there had just been a flood coming through. So it was kind of this poster child. And it made me wonder, the communities that you chose, do you think of them as, I mean, they're all anecdotes. And as a science journalist, you know, scientists kind of see anecdotes as almost a dirty word, <laughs> right? They're not, they're uh, narratives, if they're not representative of the broader data, they can be misleading. Or they can, if you're aware of that, it's not necessarily misleading. So my question is, uh, do you see these communities as outliers, as something special, that's something happening different or faster than them? Or are they really representative of what's happening in lots of other places? No, and I mean, I do make that case in the book. Like, you can uh, look at New Talk, and New Talk was named by a lot of media as America's first climate refugees, um, which is, I thought, a little bit of a strange, <laughs> a strange way to label them for, for a number of different reasons. I mean, uh, you know, they're not exactly refugees. I mean, they're moving from one part of the landscape to another. Is it um, about a mile up river? I mean, I, you it's like nine you miles. It. Yeah, oh, you can see it from day, one side to another. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and also, I think that it made them sound like they were, like you're saying, it made them sound like they were outliers. But when you look around the country, there's communities all over the coast that are having to relocate. Um, Elizabeth Russia's book, Rising, documents communities all up and down the East Coast especially that are having to move um, because of climate change, because of sea level rise and flooding. Cities often call this sort of bland term called managed retreat. Um, FEMA is buying up huge numbers of properties and asking people to relocate away from the coasts. You guys might have seen a viral video that went around a couple of weeks ago of a house, I believe it was on the coast of North Carolina, that just got carried away by the water. Um, there are estimates all over the place of the number of displaced people as a result of climate change around the globe, but it ranges into the millions. It's a, d it's a tens of millions. It's a difficult number to estimate, but um, it's a lot. So I think that New Talk is representative of what's happening in a lot of places. And one of the heartening things about New Talk is that they're actually managing to do something in a concerted way as a community rather than it happening in a sort of helter-skelter, house-by-house chaotic kind of way, which I think is also happening at the coast um, in parts of the United States even. Another community you spend a lot, spend a lot of time with is Richmond, California, mm -hmm. where the, the high school mascot is an oil well. And the high school, the high school team is the Oilers. You, mm -hmm. a detail from your book. Um, it's a community grappling with what's really a top employer, like economic bedrock of the community. That's also its pollution and the threat of explosion kind of looms over it at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, it's none of that is necessarily climate change per se, but it's uh, it's clearly fossil fuels are driving that community's tensions and also the climate change. Um, why did you choose to include Richmond? I did want to include one community where the questions that were being asked were more about fossil fuels and not just about the impacts of climate change because I think we can also ask questions about energy choices in the places that we live in. If you look here in the Pacific Northwest, the reason we don't have a ton of coal export terminals all over the Pacific Northwest, it's because people in communities all over this region objected to those terminals and voiced their... <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, communities can have a say, can have a big influence on the fossil fuel choices that we make as well. Um, I wanted to reflect on a place where those things came together, where a community was facing the impacts of fossil fuels on a very local level and was also reflecting on how they're connected to this global picture. Great. Now, I don't know if um, the cards for, qu we are gonna have question and answer, and I don't know if uh, it's probably a good time to start passing cards around for uh, if we haven't done that already. Just a reminder, so think of good questions. And uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, if you say uh, it's more of a comment than a question, it doesn't matter, because it's on a card. So, all right. Um, <laughs> One activist um, you spoke with um, in Richmond mm -hmm. uh, said sometimes she feels like she's just spitting on a wildfire. Mm -hmm. Is that all that these efforts to date add up to? 
No, I was looking at a really interesting study just yesterday, actually, in the journal Nature Communications that was trying to look at what are the impacts of local efforts across the country. And when they added up all of the commitments from states and local governments and businesses and regions, if people stick to all of those commitments, it could, um, it could add up to as much as half of the emissions that we need to cut by 2030. So what happens at the local level makes a big difference. Um, cities account for a huge amount of the world's GDP and the majority of the world's fossil fuel emissions. <laughs> so if we do something in Seattle to cut fossil fuel emissions, it reverberates around the world, I think. I mean, I don't think that's an exaggeration. If cities cut their fossil fuel emissions, it has an influence on both what other cities do and on our collective emissions. So. Of course, th that if that you mentioned is the big one, if they right. keep these commitments, we know that, I, and I wish I knew who came up with this analogy, and mm -hmm. I would love to credit them if I knew who they were, but somebody said that um, uh, saying you'll hit net zero by 2050 is like saying, I'm going to write a novel. <laughs> oh no. It's, you know, the, the work, or let's change that. It's like saying, I'm going to write a work of 100,000 words of nonfiction. <laughs> The, the actual work is actually writing it, not making these promises. Right. We've seen that from Seattle, city of Seattle government, right. to up and down the, the scale of, so it's a, yeah, commitments is, a, are often mostly not observed is my observation. They aren't <laughs> so. always, but I mean, they are to some degree. I mean, I th you know, I think California has met a lot of its climate commitments. Um, but I think also part of what I'm trying to say here is that we all have a responsibility to, to take action on this crisis and we all have more power when we come together in communities. And I don't necessarily mean, you know, that you all should run down to City Hall right now. I mean, you can if you want, but, um, <laughs> but I, I just mean that people can come together collectively and come up with all kinds of solutions even on a small scale, that make a difference in aggregate. So when you look at, um, for instance, Interfaith Power and Light and the amounts of community solar that they have put up on churches across the country, there's lots that people can do when they come together. And I think that sometimes when we neglect the amount of power that we have at that scale, we think that our main power is just by like constantly pushing our politicians. And I'm not discounting that. We need to constantly you know, push our leaders to do more. But I also think that you know, there's power at the community level that I think we could all be harnessing. And in Richmond, you really focus on a lot of this community level organizing, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, community gardens or other efforts. Um, I wonder, there's a major character there that we didn't hear from directly. And that major character is also a major player in the climate and it's Chevron. I wonder if you attempted to, to uh, get Chevron's point of view for this book. If I attempted to get Chevron's point of view for the book, I have um, reported on Chevron for a number of years. I've re done investigative reports in uh, Richmond, and I have, in a number of cases, sought Chevron's point of view. What always happens is that I'm referred to the Western States Petroleum Association, and um, I get a comment from them that is fairly generic. So I've done that quite a number of times. I didn't include one of those comments in the book because for the kind of narrative storytelling that I was offering, it didn't seem outstandingly meaningful. But I have indeed talked to um, people in the fossil fuel industry. I've talked to folks at unions. Um, I've talked to steel workers. So yes, I, I did get those perspectives. Um, but for the book and the way that I structured it, I really wanted to tell the story of particular individuals and uh, you know their journey. So I, I focused a lot on them. And you talk. I guess I could add that there is the perspective from a community member and a council member named Nat Bates, who has been a strong supporter of Chevron for many years. He's now, I believe, in his 80s. He might even be in his 90s. And I think he's still on the city council. He ran for mayor at one point and um, proudly accepted a lot of campaign support from Chevron. And I talked to him about his feelings uh, about Chevron. I talked to folks who wanted to work at Chevron, and that's also in the book. And um, you know, I, I really did want to reflect on the conundrum that the community is facing and the choices that you have to make in a community that's economically constrained about 
where you might want to find a job and about where your tax revenue comes from. And it's important to think about those as we're talking about how to transition. So, And you, you talked about fossil fuel companies as moochers and free riders um, and other kind of pejorative terms. Um, I wonder, um, since they get their money from their customers, no matter how much disinformation and, and potentially harmful lobbying they do, um, is it also, so you cite this, this factoid that people like to say that 90, I think it is, 90 companies are responsible for two-thirds of all emissions. Mm -hmm. um, but that factoid assumes that it's only the producers that are responsible, not any of the users who actually burn the product. So I wonder if that's a little bit too binary. And I wonder if, are we all, all of us who use fossil fuels, to one degree or another, and of course some have much more use or responsibility for the problem than others, are we all these freeloaders and moochers as well, to some one degree or another? I don't really look at us as free. I mean, I think that you have to look at who has power to influence, you know, our economic choices. The way that um, <laughs> you're asking me a tough question, John. Um, <laughs> That's why I get paid the nothing for this. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, the way that, um, I mean, as much as I say that communities have power over what f fossil fuel companies do, the fact of the matter is that fossil fuel companies have a huge amount of political power, a huge amount of political lobbying, a huge amount of money to throw around. And often when a fossil fuel pro project gets cited, for instance, it's cited in communities like Richmond, um, in Richmond is perhaps not the best in, uh, instance of this because the refinery has been there a very long time. But a lot of fossil fuel projects get cited in communities that do not have a lot of power to say that they don't want it there. So um, the way that our energy choices happen is often quite undemocratic. And I think that, you know, you can look at polling. A majority of Americans want, the, un the United States want their leaders to do more about climate change. Um, you know, I, I, th I think that we just haven't always been given the choices to do something other than rely on fossil fuels. We have a whole system very entrenched set up for us all to have to depend on fossil fuels. Um, and, um, <laughs> There's some hecklers in the audience, John. <laughs> <laughs> there's some uh, there's some enthusiasts in the audience. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't think it's quite th quite fair to say that the rest of us are freeloaders. Um, I don't think that we have this the same sorts of choices available to us. And I think that industries have worked hard to make sure that we don't have those choices, unfortunately. And have they succeeded? Are we just ha they're hapless victims, or do we still have agency? I do think we have agency, but I think we have agency when we come together and, and exert our collective agency, which is really what the book is about. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> we are at The Collective in downtown Seattle talking with Seattle author Madeline Ostrander about her new book, At Home on an Unruly Planet. I'm KUOW environment reporter John Ryan. Let me ask you a funner question. Um, maybe. Uh, how did the pandemic affect this book? both your kind of working on it, your reporting on it, and maybe what you wanted to say. Was there a, did it change much? I think you might need to rethink your definition of a fun question. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <laughs> I got the contract to write this book um, in the summer of 2019, and I was able to go out to New Talk, Alaska in the fall of 2019 and do some pretty um, intense reporting. If anyone's ever been to rural Alaska, you know that it's it's not necessarily a picnic to head out there. But in any case, I was able to go out there. Um, it's, it's very fascinating. Um, it's just involves sleeping on the floor of a school and other such things. Um, <laughs> so I went out to rural Alaska and I came back and I was able to do some reporting in the Meta Valley and I came back and then in the spring I was emailing Dory Robinson, who's one of the main people who I write about in the Richmond sections. And um, 
we kept talking about plans and then we were like, well, there's this thing happening. <laughs> I wonder if we're going to need to change our plans. <laughs> and then within about a week, you know, everything just turned on a dime and I had to cancel everything and I had to rethink how I was reporting the book. Um, in that case, we made alternate plans that I was going to drive down the coast on Labor Day week of September 2020 and um, report outdoors because it's an urban farming organization and everyone is outdoors. But Labor Day week, of course, most of the West Coast burst into flames. So that <laughs> didn't work out very well. So it's been a, a quite a challenge and it took me really a year longer than I thought it was gonna take me and just to adjust everything that I thought I was doing. But I also, as I mentioned previously, had been thinking about this book for 10 years and gathering a lot of string and visiting these communities. So I was able to pull things from a lot of that and then find safe ways to visit a few places post COVID and talk to people. So that's how it went down. With almost any um, climate story that comes out on my station, um, we get questions from uh, from the public, and it's always boils almost always boils down to this: is what can I do? And a lot of there's a lot of interest um, in these personal level things that I'm less interested in as a journalist. I'm more interested in the systemic problems. Um, but if you if you got that question from somebody, what would, you, what would you counsel people to do? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's also part of why I wrote this book and what I was trying to get across in the book. I think that um, a lot of the times we talk about climate change on two different scales, neither of which I think is outstandingly helpful necessarily. One of those scales is your own personal carbon footprint. You know, can I um, eat fewer hamburgers or <laughs> can I, um, you know, produce less trash. And it's not that that's not important at all. I mean, I do think it's worth asking what you're doing in your own lifestyle. I think it contributes to kind of cultural change, especially if you talk to your neighbors about it. But realistically, I think it's very confining. It's a little bit like dieting. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't address the kind of system level things in our food system that maybe lead us to make um, difficult and sometimes not good for us food choices or climate choices. The other scale that we often talk about climate change is at the federal and international scale. And as I said, the message is often that we should put pressure on our political leaders. And we absolutely, sh you know, pe I think people absolutely should be telling their political leaders what they think about this issue. But there is this middle scale where people can have an influence on their community and they can get together and sometimes come up with really innovative ideas for things that we can do about the climate crisis. And, um, those are some of the ideas that are throughout this book. So I think that I probably would s still say if people want to do something, they could go talk to their political leaders. That's definitely really, really important. We need to always do that. But I also would say that talk to your neighbors, you know, talk to people in communities that you belong to. Think about, um, try to get more information about how climate change is going to affect this region. One um, really small case, for instance, um, the sociologist Eric Kleinenberg did some work on how people respond to heat waves, like the heat wave that we just had. And um, in really vulnerable neighborhoods in Chicago, where people, so where there's a lot of people who are lower income, who don't have air conditioning, um, neighborhoods that had a lot of social capital, a lot of relationships between one another in that community could fare as well during a heat wave and have as few risks as a, as a part of the community that had a ton of air conditioning available to them and was wealthier. And I think that sometimes the simplest things of just checking in on each other, building relationship with e relationships with each other, building you know non-virtual <laughs> communities <laughs> with the people around us is really important in terms of thinking about how we confront this crisis. Great. We got a lot of great questions. I had just one at first, so I was kind of tap dancing to fill the time, and now I've got a lot. So we're gonna speed this up. This is <laughs> this is like newscast mode. If you wanna get in a newscast with a nice short sound bite, that's the kind of answers we need now, because we got a lot of great questions. I wanna get to all of them if I can. Um, uh, I'll all right, try. so just 30 <laughs> seconds, you know, go for that. Once the siren's gone, but you can hear my question. Did writing, did writing, boy, oh boy.
All right, Madeline, did writing this book increase your motivation and energy to continue climate reporting, or did it deplete you? Uh, there are probably moments when it did a little of both, <laughs> depending on the moment. There were moments when I definitely felt overwhelmed. But I think I felt so moved by the people that I was writing about. Um, you know, I've read a little bit about Carlene Anders. Um, she's a really amazing person. There are a lot of really powerful, incredible people doing things in their communities to try to figure out how we cope with this crisis. And I think telling their stories is motivating to me, and I think that's also where I find inspiration. Great. Madeline, what will it take to make fossil fuel consumption no longer acceptable? Not being able to breathe in some cities doesn't seem to be enough. <laughs> um, I didn't say they were easy questions. I, I understand. <laughs> I mean, m maybe it will take the kind of out emotional outrage that we talked about earlier in the conversation. Um, Again, I think it's, it's instructive to look at other movements, um, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, or you can look at some of the environmental movements of the 60s and 70s, which came out of outrage about things like oil spills. When people collectively feel moved, that's really powerful, and I think that leaders st start listening, but I also think that it creates a wave of cultural change. And you can look at the wave of cultural change around the way that we talk about racial justice and economic justice and how that's changed really dramatically over the last couple of years. And I'm not saying we fixed it all and it's all great. Like, obviously not. We have a ton to do on that issue as, as well as so many others. But I still think that, um, I think that if we can find that, that collective outrage and that collective emotion, that might go a long way to um, translating into political will and translating into collective actions. All right. Madeline, in, in the communities that took action in a proactive way, what are common threads you observed? What got them started? What kept them going? I think a lot of what got them started was a kind of awareness breaking over people that climate change is about me. <laughs> it's about where I live here and suddenly the world is different and in a lot of the stories that wasn't um, necessarily apparent to people beforehand um, you know an interesting thing I'm sorry that this isn't the 30 second sound bite but an interesting thing that's happened to me since um, you know as I've been preparing for this book to come out I've been having lots of random conversations with people about climate change so people that I don't normally talk to about climate change like the person adjusting my eyeglasses or the person cutting my hair or whatever. Um, and I'll say, I wrote a book, and then they'll say, what's the book about? And I'll start talking about climate change. And they'll say, oh, I haven't, you know, I haven't heard a lot about that except for the way that it's affecting animals, I guess. And I'll start pointing out the Seattle heat wave that, you know, of this year and last year. And I'll start pointing out the wildfire smoke. And I'll start talking about what's happening in Alaska. And suddenly, I can see their faces light up, this little aha moment, like, oh, I see this thing that I didn't see before. I didn't understand that climate change was about me and that it's happening around me. And I think that just that message, if we could just be telling that message to people, that's really profound. Great. I'm going to read a question and then I'm going to read a comment. Um, someone slips it in and I'm a, uh, it's a good comment, so I'm going to okay. it. But I'm gonna, it'll give you a few seconds to think of this, okay. think of the answer. So here's a tough question. Climate grief is so prevalent for me, says our questioner. I take so many steps in my own life. How do I exponentially make change? And while you're pondering, here's the comment from the last questioner. Said, um, you were asked, is it hard to keep telling this story? Your immediate answer was yes. Thank you for continuing to tell this story. Aww. Can you read the, the question So climate again? grief is so prevalent for me. I take so many steps in my own life. How do I exponentially make change? I don't know if they're talking change about the grief, change about other stuff, but yeah, um, climate grief. It's hard because I, I don't know the particular context that the questioner is coming from. Um, so I think some of it depends on where you are. You, you know, Catherine Hayhoe has a great book called Saving Us, where she talks a lot about starting where you are to take action on climate change. And she also um, shed some doubt on the idea of the carbon footprint and how much that will make a difference. But 
what if where you are is that you're a skier and you can start talking to other skiers about how climate change is impacting snowpacks and you can build a campaign around that. I mean, I think that we all are very connected. We're more connected than we realize. And if we give ourselves permission to start having these conversations, I think that can both make us feel more powerful and do a lot to make the sense of grief feel less overwhelming and more like you have other people to bear it with you. Great. And let's go for a lightning round. I promised we'd finish <laughs> up by 8.15 so there'd be lots of time for the mingling. Um, um, this, is a, this is not an easy, fast question. How did you find or choose the individuals you profiled? Were any of them reluctant or did many decline? Um, I chose the places to some degree. Um, I heard about things that were going on in particular places and the individuals just kind of rose to the surface. They were the people that everyone was talking about. <laughs> you should talk to this person. Um, the one place where people were particularly reluctant was in Newtalk, Alaska. And that I think was both because um, there's been a lot of reporters going there and also because um, of the tension of having a white person come into an indigenous community and and the history of what that has meant for them and that's something that as a reporter I have to be very sensitive to um, reporting in a community like that requires a lot of patience requires a lot of listening requires a lot of sensitivity and being delicate with people and really understanding um, their experience and what they want to convey to me rather than you know being pushy with all of my questions not that I if you know me very well at all you know that I'm not pushy but <laughs> but <laughs> were I to feel inclined um, that wouldn't work very well in such a place right. now that you've made it through your first book what will you be writing next no pressure you know, another author warned me that I would get this question. <laughs> and then I would think, but I just wrote a book. What do you want from me? No, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't necessarily have the germ of my next book all picked out. Um, I will say that one of the questions that's interested me based on the Richmond reporting is what we do about all of this old fossil fuel infrastructure that we have around the country and how we really begin asking w how it gets retired and how it gets decommissioned and what influence people who are living around those facilities have and what kind of toxic legacy we have to deal with. There are a huge number of questions this country isn't asking right now about those things and we need to be asking them immediately <laughs> because that is a difficult, slow, challenging process that has to happen everywhere if we're going to make this transition away from fossil fuels. So that is one thing that I'd like to look into. Okay. And this should be an easy one. Knowing okay. what you know, is your instinct that humans are doomed? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do there you have to it, qualify folks. that? <laughs> Do you want to say more or no? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not saying that, you know, it's, everything is guaranteed and it's all written in the, car the cards. I will say that I've heard some interesting things from um, scientists like Jonathan Foley, who's at Project Drawdown. Um, so several years ago when climate scientists were talking about where we were all headed it looked like the most likely path was for four or five degrees celsius of warming which is really catastrophic and horrifying if you know anything about climate models and i, I don't want to geek out on climate models but um so we've warmed about one degree now um it looks like now with the current commitments we are more likely headed for about two degrees. And that's not good either, right? That's twice where we are now. I'm not looking forward to that moment. But um, we've made progress and we can continue to make progress. And you know, I don't know whether we can reach 1.5 degrees, but I think it's worth fighting for. So yeah. Yeah. that's where I have hope anyway. Great. Madeline Ostrander, thank you very much for writing this book and for talking with us about it tonight. Thanks so much, John.